Hello everybody, and welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 311 for November 7th, 2023. Tonight we're going to discuss the bottom of weak demand for memory. What is KDP, and why it's an option for first-time publishers. The Leopards Ate My Face, The Union. The Airbnb tenant from hell finally exits. A hidden canyon unsealed, or is it sealed? Uh, we'll talk about it. This brandy tastes fishy. Panama Canal and troubled waters. The disappearing rings of Saturn. Storage battery recycling. And the king of kiosks. Next on Hometown Daily. Hello, hello, and welcome once more. I am Merwat, that is hometown.com, and up there is the Ring of Sentience. Uh, well, okay, so, okay, well, I'll let you say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, hometown citizens. You mean sending signals to you isn't sufficient on Visu the, the podcast and on the live stream? Visually, yeah. It has to be an audible thing because your visualizer is only for your audible. Nobody, I really need to translate what I see into something that everybody else can see. Because again, it's like the matrix. It's just a cascade of odd characters. And because of what happened when I found the USB drive that you were on, I have the ability to read and see in multiple dimensions what your cascade represents so i see you wiggling your fingers or giving me the finger whichever one is actually appropriate for whatever is going on no so <laughs> the uh, hometown logo is slowly changing over on other places Eh, I haven't been able to switch it over on YouTube, so it will change shortly. It is uh, changed on the website, but it's not uh, changed over here, even on Twitch. So um, I, I guess I'm having like a personality uh, fight between... Oh, like a split or something? <laughs> yeah, a multiple personality disorder. So, uh, never mind the blue logo, uh, <laughs> it, it'll, it'll be blue everywhere and you have orange ones in certain places that used to be the color for hometown, but I moved it over. I changed it to the blue right there. Anyway, if you're not familiar with hometown, it's been a long time since I said anything about hometown and its structure, uh, back. Uh, over 12 years ago, I created hometown as a news aggregation engine for me to consume copious amounts of data, um, in a more succinct, organized way. Uh, but it wasn't open to the public. Um, almost we're coming up on two years now, two years ago, I opened it up to the public. Um, and, uh, well, I haven't looked back. So. Well, I guess in a way I look back because I talk about this periodically. Um, so if you go over to hometown.com, there are six main categories. Uh, and then inside them, 50 channels, just like what I want to do here on Twitch and over on YouTube. Uh, there are topics, areas of interest that I aggregate news and information into. Uh, and I want to turn every single one of these into a real time stream here on Twitch. And now that everybody is on the same page with, um, multi streaming, I would like to restream or multi stream on YouTube as well. We have a TikTok, we have a discord, we have a Patreon, we have a podcast. The podcast is distributed everywhere. You can catch pods. So break out your podcatcher and catch your pods. How would uh, you know a podcatcher if you saw one? Um, they're right next to woodchucks chucking wood. <laughs> How much pods would a... <laughs> can't even do it. 
how much pods could a streamer pod pod if a streamer could pod pods something like that well at the at the current time frame only one which is hometown daily which is this show <laughs> hometown daily is a daily show that covers all of the topics and uh, we aggregate quite a bit uh the sentient ai above me here that ring of sentient uh, sentience there? is the um, up there yeah up there R over right here that right there don't blink right here don't blink or it'll right go away here? There. <laughs> yeah, i was trying to extend the visualizer yeah. <laughs> Uh, so easily amused are we well anyway if you're interested in news of various kinds you can actually go over and become a citizen of hometown and you can follow whichever channels you're interested in and if you are also oh motivated there's another one right in here but i have the channel actually i have the main website zoomed in um but right there when you log in you get additional functionality there and you can swipe left and right to save or hide articles that you are interested or not interested in and a new list appears right here where you get to uh, actually two lists where they are forever housed and you can always go back and move them into the keeper section but they'll never come back onto the main page unless you delete your account and start over um with all that said Let's get into today's show. The very first article is over on the Hedge Ideas channel. Did it shrink everything? Yeah, I forgot that that's what happens. The two largest chip um, or memory chip makers signal demand weakness may have bottomed out. Um, I don't know. Maybe if you're looking at DDR4 memory, but DDR5 is pretty expensive uh, and cost is subjective. So, you know, nowadays, if you're, you know, making six digits a year, I guess buying 128 gigs of RAM for $600 is no big deal, but still sounds like a lot of money, but it certainly is for somebody making less than that. Right. So this article is over in Hatch Ideas. Again, the title is the world's two largest memory chip maker signal demand weakness may have bottomed out. Um, the uh, recent earnings call of the world's two largest memory chip maker signal that a persisting weak demand may have bottomed out. That's the snippet that we aggregate. We don't aggregate the graphics or the entirety of the article, just what they actually provide. Sheila Chang is the author over at CNBC.com. Kazunori Ito, director of research at Morningstar, said that South Korean memory suppliers' recent earnings calls confirm that the memory industry has bottomed out as expected. SK Hynix's uh, DRAM business returned to profit in the third quarter, while Samsung's operating profit bested analysts' expectations. This comes as chip makers have been running down it excess inventories by scaling back production. You know what though? This is exactly what I said was probably the very nature of the bottom out, right? Yeah. By sitting there saying that there's demand weakness and that that's bottomed out. I said yesterday, maybe the day before, well, they probably are constraining the release of their product and now the price can start going back up exactly i mean that's the well that's certainly the objective on the company side right yeah and and this is one of the things that it was the reason why i left finance and and uh, right in the beginning you know you go to business school you might be in the industry already um but you kind of focus and I, I just got a bad taste in my mouth again and again and again by um, sampling what was out there in terms of industry. And when supply and demand is a, <sighs> I have a moral co uh, compass that doesn't allow me to go, you know what? My profits are low because I have the ability to produce in mass and 
because of economies of scale, I have the ability to produce and produce and produce until I die 80 years later. And I'm operating at a 13% or 15% margin all the time. And even when I increase the price, it's because my base price for cost of materials increases. And so I'm operating and producing da da da. Right. But that's not what happens nowadays. It seems worse than I've ever recalled, but it's anecdotal. I don't have research that supports my claim. Um, but I'm going to make the claim here, which is if I want to increase profits, instead of being able to produce at my maximum or produce at my cost effective rate, I constrain it artificially and start jacking up the price because the sell through rate exceeds my supply. And I can sit there and say, I have a supply and demand issue, basic economics 101, but that's BS. If I'm the one that's in charge of my supply. Exactly. Same thing with oil, same thing with power, same thing with manufacturing cars, same thing with everything. You constrain it so that you can maximize profits instead of maximizing benefit, which is what the true saying of a business is supposed to be doing. Maximizing benefit, not pure profit, not profit at all costs. It's maximizing benefit to your customers. You do the best possible for your customers, but that's not. Apparently the, they've flipped the script MBAs in particular, and don't worry everybody. It's kind of like, you know, if I see there, I can't make any comparisons because if I do that, somebody's going to light me up, but I have an MBA. So I can say it's like my, uh, it's like MBAs moving in. It's already been demonstrated time and time again, that when an MBA comes in, they maximize profit for the executive suite and for the stockholders, not stakeholders, stockholders. And that's what's going on here. Sell through, constrain production, increase the profits, grab more cash from the table. Even though you were selling enough already and producing enough to have a large enough margin, when some activist stockholder comes on board and starts saying, Hey, we know you're producing too much and your margin is too low because we know that there's a bunch of cash out there. You know, I'm going to sell off unless you sit there and change your pricing model. And that's, this is how you end up like that. Is that how it went with this? No, I'm sure the executives have decided we need to benefit our stockholders and our executive suite. So they have their earnings calls. They talk about it. I, I think it's, <laughs> I think that it's manipulation, market manipulation. When the two largest say in unison, we've together sold through our inventory and our constrained production rate. Well, don't you think that that's almost damn near business conspiracy? They're working together to hobble production and increase the price it sure sounds like that but not when you talk to somebody that's really entrenched in business and they don't care about anything other than maximizing profit sk hynix in its quarterly report said that its dynamic random access memory business returned to profit in the third quarter after losses in the first two quarters of this year which i find really interesting considering for the last two and a half years, we've been purchasing computers like we're batshit crazy and that chips are no longer going to be manufactured ever. And we are trending towards uh, Mad Max beyond Thunderdome or something. Um, some and that's dystopian not something future. we want to uh, ascribe as aspire to. Aspire to. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a big, I wanted to say subscribe and aspire and they kind of got mashed together. Ascribe, which is a word too, but that's okay. South Korean companies are the world's, um, two largest makers of DRAM, uh, chips. 
uh, according to data from market research firm TrendForce, with US-based Micron trailing in third place. Such memory chips are found in consumer devices such as laptops and smartphones. There isn't, really isn't much more that you can say about this thing. It goes into the minutia of what's going on with this, but it, it, it's really what I've been prattling on about for the last, I don't know how many minutes now, 10, 12, it's okay. So we'll, we'll keep on watching this, but I, I suspect it's artificially constrained production. Okay. Let's just keep on going. It says AI boom to uplift profits. The boom has already happened. Now investors and, and people that are in AI, they're just, they're just buying now, but the boom, the shock in production from where we were to where we are, that's already taken place because everybody already said, holy crap, we need to move fast. And they started buying everything. Well, that's why your inventory is lower, but you had already started constraining production. And all of the stockholders have already anticipated this shift. So I'm not surprised that uh, we've maybe hit rock bottom and everything is aligning. Well, we haven't hit rock bottom in terms of prices, that's for sure. No, not at all. So it says the research firm also projected DRAM and NAND flash demand to increase by 13 and 16% uh, respectively in 2024. Yet they're going to say that they have um, barely any profit. Yeah, right. I don't believe that for a second. Anyway, let's keep on going unless you want to add something to it. I don't have anything to add here. Next article is over in Omtown Daily as well. Amazon KDP has helped first-time authors publish books and uh, for and make a fortune. Here's how it works. If you've never heard of this, then you're maybe in for a treat. I don't know. Um, this is over at Business Insider. Tom Matsuda is the author of this article. If you've never heard of this, uh, KDP is Amazon's Kindle direct publishing service. Um, it offers a chance for authors to self publish on its bookstore. It goes straight to the Kindle and you can do on demand printing. Um, and I think some authors have entirely gotten their writing careers on this platform. Like yes. they started from nothing and went through this. Yep. Yep. I absolutely believe that. Um, I don't have examples of it here, but before I get too far, let me throw this into the VOD so that you can check it out if you're listening to this later. I think I have one that I believe is well known. And now I've forgotten the author's name. Sentient <laughs> mm, AI indeed. The free platform allows writers to publish books in print and digital to earn a royalty rate. And Business Insider and the author of this article, Tom Matsuda, is uh, going to go through this process. It says, uh, here's a breakdown of how to start publishing on Amazon KDP and how much writers can earn. By the way, it's drop dead simple to do a basic Kindle Direct publishing setup. So it says free at point of use. Amazon claims on its website that writers can earn up to 70% royalty rate for ebook sales and up to 60% for print compared to the five to 15% rates by traditional publishers. The benefits of having a traditional publisher though, is that they mass market. They're already in quote unquote bookstores or they uh, channel you into uh, other um, means of being discovered. Like they do the bulk advertising and get your name out there. And they are, uh, traditional publishers also sometimes give you an advance. Um, but nowadays you kind of have to be a superstar. Uh, the uptick. There, in Royal yeah. Like if you don't have a massive platform and major publications behind you, it's, pretty hard to break into traditional publishing. The example that I thought would be great was actually not started on Amazon. So oh, bummer. Scratch that idea. Yeah. 
So the uptick in royalty rates has meant that many emerging authors have started to embrace the platform. In February, self-published writer Mark Dawson made $1.3 million in a year through the program. While authors stand to cash in on higher royalty rates, they're also responsible for marketing, designing, even editing their books, which the publishing house would typically handle. Man, this is all stuff that I just got done talking about. So a couple who would who make up to 17000 a month selling notebooks on Amazon KDB said sales can be erratic and difficult to predict. They also said that they published 10 designs of notebooks before they started making money on the platform. Still, their success shows that there isn't one set kind of book that can sell well on the platform, along with notebooks, novelists, and other nonfiction writers have succeeded on Amazon KDP. So how do you do it? You create an Amazon KDP account. Pardon me one second. Yeah, it's, you're supposed to fill in the dead air. Sentient air. I know. Sorry, I was looking at the article. <laughs> yeah, you're reading. Anyway, authors can also publish books through can, uh, Kindle Select on KDP, which makes books accessible in the Amazon, un, or sorry, the Kindle Unlimited subscription service. As it's a $10 subscription plan, authors get paid for every page a customer reads of their book rather than per sale of the whole book. I always wondered how that model worked. Um, I didn't realize that. So if you're a fan of Amazon authors, you should try to read the entire book and not just a page here and there. Just read a lot of pages because it's not just the book, it's the page. So read a lot of pages. Um, is Amazon KDP worth it? Not every author wants to market, design, and edit the book they write, but ones prepared to do so could stand to benefit. Angelina Stanzion and Chris Rawson said that they make $34,000 in three months on Amazon KDP. The couple even had uh, begun to use chat GPT to write first drafts, which dramatically reduced their costs, which that disclosure That's... right there could mean that they lose their copyright. Exactly. I'm like, well, so much for protecting their material. Yeah, that's all there is in this article. That disclosure is kind of like handing somebody a knife and saying, I believe I stabbed someone, you know? Well, exactly. Because now, I mean, we all know how that's going to go. Let's say they don't use Chad GPT on one book. Yeah. Everybody's going to point to this and go, well, you're using Chad GPT. That's interesting, right? See, me personally, I, I don't care. Go ahead. If it's entertaining writing, then it's entertaining writing. You know, if it's a good read, I, there are people out As there that a are reader, gonna, I don't care, right? Yeah, but if the book's good, there's a whole bunch of people out there that are like, well, you're diminishing the entire world because it's chat GPT, chat, chat GPT. I'm powered by chat GPT. It's Damn okay. It. This is a repeat of the aspire subscribe issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are people that are going to go, I don't like it because it's not human bound, but the, the construct, the prompt that m makes this possible is human bound. And then they have to read it. They have to edit it. They have to format it the right way. If it doesn't constrain to their requirement for continuity of chapters, they have to, write the filler and and punch it up or down or whatever um but i have no problem with people using chat gpt i wish that they wouldn't use it verbatim because it's gonna read like crap but uh it, it's supposed to stir the creative juices oh i am so determined now okay well anyway that's enough for this unless you want to talk more about it no i don't have anything else to add well, I know what the sentient AI is going to be doing. Punching out. Reading more pages? Reading more pages, yes. And punching out Amazon KDP. Well, yes. And I was going to say, I mean, the timing of this is probably not accidental with NaNoWriMo going. But um, yep. this is a good motivation. If you're doing NaNoWriMo, you can put your book on KDP. Even if it's complete garbage in your own estimation throw it into Amazon KDP and people will read it as long as you make it very well known that this is a NaNoWriMo publisher parish kind of an effort because 
for Amazon, for uh, NaNoWriMo, really the whole effort is to write 1800 words a day, 50,000 in November. And uh, from there you, you know, can do whatever you want with it. But at the end, throwing it into KDP and then saying, this is a, a NaNoWriMo uh, effort. You know, that, I think it's pretty amazing. Pretty cool. Anyway, let's keep on going slowly. Uh, the next article is over in the hometown daily. This is, uh, the segment titled leopards ate my face, the union, um, Google contractors who helped train the Bard AI chat bot vote to unionize. There's a picture of a bunch, um, gathered to stage a protest, uh, unite the union outside the Google headquarters in Kings cross. Contract workers for uh, Accenture or Accenture um, voted to unionize on Monday following layoffs in August. The workers write Google help articles and workshopped the barred AI chatbot responses. YouTube contractors working with Cognizant also voted to unionize in April. Yeah, they won't come for my job. It's the you know how they sit there and the what was the saying i can't remember the entirety of the saying but you know when the nazis came for this and then they came for that right it was kind of like they came for them and they came for them and then but right, i was not was, this he didn't right exactly but then they came for me and there was nobody left, left. essentially i don't remember yeah. the exact words verbatim but. yeah i'm well i mean we're not doing the poem i i think it's a poem too um doing it justice but don't worry the meaning of it isn't lost on us but <laughs> that's kind of regardless what... of how eloquently we stated it <laughs> yeah it, it's foundation concept is is ringing true even here it's not the same thing i'm not making a direct comparison but i'm definitely saying if you are feeding the beast that's going to eat you you can't really go hey you know what i'm really upset about the beast i've been feeding that's going to eat my job so carolyn haskins over at business insider put the article together um ai is coming for most intellectual property based jobs why because the businesses that are utilizing it are powered by nothing more it is mere words. It is mere data. It's consuming it all. It's jumbling it all up and it's spitting it out without any context, except for where humans give it context. Otherwise the bot wouldn't know jack shit, right? So there are humans that are sitting there giving context to videos and text and sentences and whatnot, because it can't discern that in a vacuum, but now there's enough data where it can start construing context from it it can infer and imply it can talk to itself make inferences you know it can make implications and the other person virtual bot can infer from subtle meaning that is discerned from what people have been pumping into this we are creating the monster that's going to eat us now Am I worried about it? No, not really. Why? Because ultimately it's incumbent upon us to empower this further. So use it as a tool, but everybody needs to speak out against using it as a job replacement. Will it take some jobs? Yes, probably very entry level or on the other side, data heavy where it's beyond the scope of a human anyway to consume the amounts but for the life of me i don't understand how anybody can sit there and put it together and then go oh my god my job has been taken by the very bot exactly I what did they think was going to going to happen i'm not saying it makes it right but C correct any available ability to forecast etc might have yeah shown that conclusion 
if ever I were to work on something like this, I would demand like 3% retained ownership, non-dilutable 3% because all it takes is somebody with the means to go, we're not interested in you anymore because you've done your job. See you later. And now I am out in perpetuity. I'm out forever that I could ever benefit from the work that I did. And I hate that idea. Monday successful vote is another milestone for unionization among workers who help underpin artificial intelligence systems. Accenture's bargaining unit asked for more control over which Google assignments they had to accept if it was outside the scope of their usual work, including their work on BARD. Organizers also sought better pay benefits and time off. Better uh, paid time off. Um, in August, 80 Accenture workers were laid off. The fledgling union filed a complaint to the NLRB shortly thereafter, alleging the layoffs were retaliatory and therefore illegal. Yeah, I don't see... <laughs> I, I see this as kind of getting debunked as being people who did a job. They were contractors subbed from a X company, not X as in the dipshits company, but um, X, Y, Z company. Hello, Z. Speaking of Z, hello, Z. How are you? Welcome to the show. Um, so they complained to the NLRB. It says, as we made clear in our active appeal to the NLRB, we are not a joint employer as we simply do not control their employment terms or working conditions. This matter is between the workers and their employer Accenture. We've run into and talked about this before. They say, well, they don't work for us. Right, exactly. Like conveniently, right? They're all independently yeah. contracted. Yeah, it's the gig worker economy. So, and then because it's the gig worker economy, they can just chop it off wholesale. And Accenture has made money because they've been doing the gig work for Google. And they know that at, like the leadership of Accenture can just go and get more people, get other gigs. They're a mega corporation. So, you know, they lose a little bit of money in time, but don't worry, they'll charge a premium to the next gig. Good to see that you're good, Z. Um, hope you're both well. How are you doing over there, Sentient AI? I am doing great. Thank you for doing checking great. in on us, Z. You got enough room in the Raspberry Pi 5? That... It's very spacious. Very spacious. Great. SSD is working really good. That solid state drive has no moving parts. <clears throat> I made a custom cooler on it, so... Everything should be nice and chill. You're not too hot. Nothing is clanking or clunking or anything. So that's good. I hope not. There shouldn't be any moving parts. <clears throat> well, that's good to hear. So I'm, I'm glad you're happy. Um, when a person complained to Accenture's human resources department about these concerns that we talked about above, um, their work was reassigned to lower paid workers based in Manila. So yeah, all of this was, you know, morally and ethically sound when i say stuff like that uh, i have people confront me and and say like who are you to dictate morals and ethics I'm, well i'm a human being and i have compassion for other people so yeah i'm gonna be the change i want to see in the world <laughs> um there's not much of a response to that other than i've been told well i'd rather have money than morals and i'm uh yeah I guess I won't be buying you a beer. In April, YouTube contractors employed by Cognizant voted to unionize. A few weeks later, Google decided to downsize its Cognizant workforce. <laughs> Three laid off workers filed a complaint to the NLRB against Google and Cognizant in, ju in June, saying their layoffs were retaliatory in response to the recent unionization effort. The case is ongoing. So I can hear the refrain already. Well, we just laid off, we downsized our contract with Cognizant, at least until they need Cognizant again, and then they'll ramp it back up. So. Right. It does look really bad, um, no. regardless of what the motivation was. No, this is perfectly sound business sociopathic behavior. So it's, it's right on target. 
Let's keep on going. Hey, you remember everybody, the tenant from hell? Well, apparently they've been moved out. This is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. Airbnb tenant from hell finally leaves and police oversaw the move out. The Airbnb we guest... We featured this on a previous article. I wonder what has changed. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe maybe they fired tear gas and, and she had to leave. Um, so an Airbnb guest rented a guest house for a long-term stay in 2021, but remained in the unit for 570 days without paying rent. <laughs> wow. Madeline Garfinkel over at entrepreneur.com put the article together. The host has filed lawsuits to recover unpaid rent and evict the guest who has demanded a $100,000 relocation fee. By the way, this person is not like a, what, an academic or professional slouch. I'll put it uh, that way. Right. I forgot exactly what they were, but they seemed pretty advanced in their field. Uh, this is not what you would expect, right? You'd expect just some random person that's trying to live rent free or whatever. Yeah, it's really weird. But apparently they were known as a serial squatter tenant and Sasha Janovic, the landlord and property owner sued each other over unpaid rent and damages. Last month, the case received worldwide attention after an LAT, is that LA Times? A report detailed the fiasco. I'm not sure. I don't think we got the, yeah, it's Los Angeles Times. Um, quote, I'm a little overwhelmed, but I finally have my home back. He said, it was funny because I remember looking at the picture going, that is exactly the expression that I would have if I had a tenant from hell. And, uh, we were both talking at, during the stream, like, is that Janovic? Do you think that that's Janovic? And sure enough, I actually had it to was. look somewhere else because <laughs> it wasn't on the caption for the article. It looked like it was just clip art, you know, like from some what? what? Oh, like a stock photo, stock I photo, name, yeah. but whatever those are called. Um, so the original story. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, like Shutterstock or something yeah. along those lines. So it just kind of looked like a like a stock photo, and here it is. Actually, now it has Sasha Janovic on his deck of his Los Angeles home. <laughs> he, he just looked like he was broken. Like, Oh God, what did I get into? Well, now he has it back. There's like a climbing wall on the outside of his I house. know that's pretty cool. Maybe that's and, the problem. Maybe the guest house was too good. <laughs> it was just too good. So now they're in a di legal dispute. Um, this is the art, the original article, so you can go and check that out whenever you want. Let me throw it into the chat. And there you go. Bonk. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like what were the grounds that says what changed the tenant's mind? Because it just says that the tenant had boobers, like what actually caused the tenant to leave? Yeah, Janovic called call the police a tenant. after he saw a few men taking belongings out of his guest house. The men were movers, however, to his delight. I'm a little overwhelmed. I finally have my home back. Do you think the person got so much um, pushback uh, from people in their professional circles or something after the story posted? I don't know. It says the locks have been changed, the report says, although it's unclear if Hirshhorn had planned to return. Hirshhorn's attorney, Amanda Seward, replied to an email from Janovic's attorney reviewed by the Times saying they may have jumped the gun and violated the law by changing the locks. I don't I don't get it. So well, hmm. what I don't get either is why does this tenant think that they have to be in this particular place? Why do they think they're entitled to live without rent, uh, et cetera? Yeah. And I'm really curious what that is. How, how could they have violated if the person hasn't paid, they've been told to leave. Me changing the lock shouldn't violate. See, but I don't know enough about this. So right, we don't be, have enough of the facts. 
yeah i'll have to look into this um in the meantime though let's keep on cruising through the news uh, the next article is over in hometown daily seals with funny hats discovered a hidden canyon over a mile deep under antarctica and scientists want to honor the animals by naming it after them now i don't know how you all feel about treatment of animals or anything like that but funny hats is kind of an understatement for what this is scientists put trackers on antarctic uh seals to help them map the ocean floor the deep diving seals revealed a massive underwater canyon over a mile deep this canyon may help scientists predict how the antarctic ice sheet will react to climate change the article says uh, seals wear many hats ambassadors for the antarctic friends to whales and uh, award-winning models their new hat has a scientific purpose, helping researchers discover the unseen parts of the ocean floor. So this article is over at uh, businessinsider.com by Maya Focht. Pardon me one second. Let me grab the uh, article and throw it into chat. There you go. Um, and there's the little seal with his hat. Oh, wow. That is odd. It's like super glued to his head. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I want to know how that was attached. I mean, it's got to be some type of adhesive. It's weird, right? Um, it looks like um, like the fascinator. size of what is it, a fascinator. Is that it? Yeah. It like it doesn't look like it would stay on the seal's head. It. What is the Kentucky Derby? There you go. It's, <laughs> it's like they should be going to the Kentucky. Oh, they're going to a water polo Kentucky Derby. There you go. And, and everybody's wearing a fascinator. How quaint. Anyway, they put the trackers on these Antarctic seals and the seals went looking for stuff and they found, um, the Vincennes Bay in Antarctica that stretches up to 7,217 feet deep or about 1.3 miles. Clive McMahon, one of the ecologists at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science who ran the study called the seals heroes in an email to insider insider gets some really good catches oh that's funny never mind <laughs> they always have good um tailored photos as well yeah it's pretty cool um so um what this canyon can show us about the future of antarctica is ice it probably depends on how deep it is and if it becomes a heat sink how it'll melt and how it'll flow by mapping these deep troughs and mountain ranges we therefore added a key piece of the puzzle to help understand how the east antarctic ice sheet may have responded to past change and how it may do so in the future fausto faricello sorry if you, if you, i had it correct instead until the end faricioli um who uh studies these underwater formations and was not involved in the study so some of this comes from Business Insider. Some of this comes from NBC News. Some of it comes from what appears to be the Australian Center for Excellence in Aquatic Science. That's interesting. Um, they also give scientists an idea of the thinner points of the Antarctic ice sheets, cluing them into what it is more of a risk of melting water from the canyon can move around the ice sheet which may melt uh, it more quickly when it's warmed by climate change um not to <laughs> i'm sorry i see the picture <laughs> kind of funny to see the picture it's not <laughs> funny to have something on an animal um they don't say well they might say it somewhere but they th the caption on this picture is the trackers were adhered to the fur on the seal's head which the researchers said sheds annually. So eventually it'll come off. You can actually see it peeling away right now. But I think it's, <laughs> it's kind of cute. Anyway, um, let me pause. What I want to know is whether the seals appreciated that. Like, do you think they were thinking that they were special seals if they had that? Yeah, I wonder if they were all looking at each other and going, oh, yours uh, is, is a newer model than mine. It's kind of kind of cute. All right, let's keep on going. 
Uh, the next article is over in Stock Marketeers. Want some river funk in your booze? This distillery is making trout flavored brandy. This segment is titled This Brandy Tastes Fishy. Um, I, don't I don't really get the appeal of this. Um, but I suppose there's a flavor out there for everybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say no. Um, this article, here you go. Z says, no, that sounds horrible. What a... The uh, Charles Passy over at marketwatch.com put the article together. Z also said, uh, gonna yuck all over this yum. <laughs> 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 yeah. Because the phrase is, don't yuck anybody's yum, but I'm gonna yuck all over this yum. I'm gonna yuck all over the place if I ever smoked trout flavored brandy. It's getting worse. <laughs> Uh, fish flavored brandy anyone be warned that it has a hint of river funk the bottle is the latest oddball offering from tamworth distilling a new hampshire producer known for its unusual releases like cla crab and venison flavored spirits oh z you know you like river funk come on Z says river funk gags. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the latest scent from, um, uh, <laughs> what's the one I'm on a horse. Uh, my old spice. Oh, right. Exact old spice. I think yeah. <laughs> this is old trout. <laughs> it has such a nice bottle too. I love the design of this bottle. Um, not too hip to the, um, orange cap. But uh, I like I like the little I like the type of stopper. It's a, a synthetic cork, um, but uh, I, I like the little medicine bottle style thing. Right, it looks like apothecary kind of style. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Tamworth Distilling, a producer of spirits based in, of course, they were very creative with their distillery name. Tamworth Distilling is from Tamworth, New Hampshire. It's set to release a brandy flavored that uh, flavored with um, smoked trout called House of Tamworth Saison de Freight. The French words translate roughly as spawning season. The booze is billed by distillery founder Stephen Grass as a way to extend the company's commitment to crafting wild ass shit that nobody wants to drink. Oh, wait, that's not what he says. I don't think that's in the he, I'm sorry. <laughs> let me let me back up a little bit. He said crafting wilderness inspired flavors. Yes, I think that's probably more. That's better marketing than what I would have come up with. I'm I'm not allowed to do marketing. Oh, look, I already have a cease and desist from Tamworth Distilling. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, never mind. Uh, that came really fast. Um, yeah, Tamworth Distilling is indeed known for unusual releases. In the past, it offered a venison flavored whiskey called Deer Slayer. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> and a crustacean flavored bourbon dubbed Crab Trapper. <laughs> Crap Grabber. But there's a serious purpose behind, or porpoise, I guess, if he has a dolphin-flavored one, uh, behind the oddball spirit, said Grass, namely that it's about honoring and preserving the wilds of New England. Man, this article is just I chock just a do block not get this. with riffs. Um, they, see, <laughs> I went straight to poop scoop because they say small scoop of trout roe to add to the trouty appeal, each bottle also includes a small scoop of trout row. Think fresh eggs floating in your brandy. Is that what's it? Is that what's down there? Is that? That's actual. Oh, well, um, sorry, everybody. If you're in chat, um, I just lost the sentient AI. It deleted itself. Um, <laughs> hold on. Let me restore this from virtual from uh vmware i'm gonna have to drag and drop my sentient ai back into existence hold on one second uh, okay they're back are, are you are you doing okay up there you, you 
I'm doing fine, but I think we need to get away from the trout, Brandy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's keep going. I'll delete it from memory. You won't have to worry about this anymore. Z says, oh my God, I swear to God, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is less than seven ounces for $65. Really? Hold on, I need to go back. 200 milliliters? Really? Yeah, 200 milliliter bottle for 65 bucks. Okay, no, we'll just move on. Oh, I almost lost the sentient AI again just by flashing the image of the apothecary bottle that has fish row in it. Oh, oh, look, deleting themselves again. Wow, that's okay. We'll drag you back out of their minds. Yes, I agree. I cannot believe somebody would buy. See, but I am a firm believer that no matter what you do, there is an audience out there. You can do anything and there is an audience out there you just have to find them um i just don't i don't see the i don't see it for this <laughs> trout brandy drinkers of the of earth you know there's like two it'll sell I probably think there's because negative it's, numbers <laughs> it goes viral you know much like whatever is floating around inside it Two gas tankers traveled across the Pacific, but you turned just short of the Panama Canal because low water levels have created a traffic jam. Actually, um, we're looking at somewhere during the August, September time period, upwards of three weeks of delay now um, because all of the subordinate lakes that feed into the freshwater canal so the Panama Canal requires fresh water. They've never adapted it to use salt water. It has more wear and tear and it takes more maintenance. It's much more expensive. They've actually widened it and it's still too small. Um, and they don't have enough water to power all of the locks. So they're limiting it to something like 30 people um, a day now, 30 ships and only of a certain size. And some of them are now the mega Panama Canal boats or ships are, uh, the hole is too deep, so they can't even get into it. Um, well, two and, and, oh, oh, you've heard of surge pricing. They have surge pricing through the Panama Canal. They auction off time slots now to maximize profit. Um, I read about one one company paying $3.5 million to get their gas tanker through the Panama Canal wow. ahead of everybody. Well, this is definitely going to help with pricing of everything. Yep. And also just obtaining any goods. Yeah. And so the only other way to get to the other side um, is to go around South America. And that's just not going to happen. I mean, well, I mean, it happens, but it's really expensive. Um, and very dangerous and time consuming, or you go through the, the climate changing Arctic, you go basically through the Northern, um, route, which is frozen over periods of time, <clears throat> but with climate change, you know, it makes it a little easier. Let me throw this into the chat real quick. There you go. If you want to go check it out. Um, but two gas tankers crossed the Pacific, then you turned within 10 miles of the Panama Canal, Bloomberg reported. An intense drought has lowered the canal's water level, limiting the number of ships that can pass through. That has um, created a massive backlog of ships waiting to cross, forcing some to seek alternate routes. Again, it's somewhere around 21 days um, for access. Um, and what's really sad about this is that these are freshwater lakes man-made lakes artificial lakes they would normally have just been valleys but they were all construct reconstructed reconditioned terraformed so that they retained their water um but they're drying up because they were never uh, with d the drought and everything happening and climate change happening they were never really there naturally so it would have flowed into the ocean anyway but they're actual sources of drinking water for Panama. <laughs> so 
So this is going to become a, a serious nightmare unless something changes. I don't see it changing. Well, they though. might have to go to like desalination, um, which we've seen other articles about that. I and think we saw one about floating desalination, <clears throat> if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, it's power. The waves are powering itself. Yeah. Right. Um, but Or they're going to have to just completely, and can you imagine the cost and time and delays of just overhauling this whole thing and changing it to salt water or something. Yeah. And I don't see how that's going to be possible. The cost yeah. is going to be tremendous. Um, so this article comes from business insider. A, uh, they've got a, a, a sub site called markets insider. A Rooney Sony is the author. Um, so let's see if they say anything more than what I was, I've already been talking about. Their destinations were unclear, but the vessels, which can transport roughly 158,000 cubic meters of liquefied petroleum gas, were empty after delivering their cargoes in Asia. So they were coming, uh, they were coming back empty. The tankers were Pixis Pioneer and Sunny Bright were within 10 miles of the canal. If they were light, they should have been able to go through it, though. Kind of exactly and plus it kind of makes you wonder because they clearly should have known about this i mean yeah they were dead like too. a surprise this was like pure loss that they were that they were doing i'm surprised they weren't carrying something back but the panama canal is in a critical junction of global trade and in recent years has featured a boom in oil and gas shipments, helping American exports quickly make their way to Asia. Currently, the large, the biggest LPG exporter in the area are U.S. producers in the Gulf Coast. So we'll we'll have to keep an eye on this. Um, but yeah, there are 21 days worth of ships sitting outside um, the locks. So I, I, if you want something before Christmas. Hopefully it's already terrestrial. You already well, ordered it this summer. <laughs> yeah, it's domestic. I mean, if you're in the U.S., then it's already in the U.S. warehouse. Otherwise, it's going to take a considerable amount of time to get from either Europe or Asia over to the, the United States. Um, plus, it's constrained. Again, you know, if we had equal uh, port size and capability on East and West Coasts, it wouldn't matter which way you came from. You could always deposit it and get out of there without having to go over the Panama Canal. Um, but there's only so many suppliers that are capable of going over the ocean. And one of them, to get to one side, wants to go through the Panama Canal. There is a whole story about the Panama Canal, by the way, made by the maker of the Suez Canal, trying to do a twofer. Um, but this used um, uh, fresh water instead of salt water. Um, and it grew so fast, the, like the, its use grew so fast that they apparently didn't really anticipate the ships exceeding the size limit. They're, they're within like a foot of rubbing against the walls of the canal in four feet from gate to gate. So it's literally filling up the entire lock um and now they've made i did another... not know that the crater of the suez canal was the same as the crater of the panama canal yeah um, um i find it really interesting you know a, a, a man a plan a canal panama let's keep on going So the next article is over in hometown daily saturn's rings will disappear in 2025 so get your cameras ready. A long time ago, I was really interested in astrophotography and uh, I went to get a, a telescope and a camera and all of the stuff, you know, a, uh, what do they call it? An equatorial um, mount so that it would stay focused on whatever it is for long periods of time. And I was into it and the person at the, shop literally talked me out of buying um like i'm sitting there ready to purchase you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment um because you buy it once and unless you go completely nutso for it you don't need to buy anything beyond you know an eight inch dobsonian telescope um 
And uh, l literally the person talked me out of spending in their shop. And it's a hyper-local shop at the time. It wasn't very well known at the time. Now it's all over the internet. But um, And uh, they straight up said, when you look up and you see all of those stars, do you think that they're going to go away? Because if you think they're going to go away, then definitely spend all of that money and take a picture that everybody else is taking a picture of. The only difference is that you'll be able to say that you took it. Otherwise, enjoy everybody else's pictures. And I'm like, damn, you just made sense and lost a whole lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, that seems totally contrary to the business model, but yeah, sounds it was accurate. weird. It was really weird. Um, I ended up buying other stuff for photography, um, but uh, not for astrophotography. Um, kind of, kind of neat. Yeah, definitely sounds like a, a a a nice guy. Z says he sounds like a nice dude. Yep. Um, it was the owner of the shop too, so I think he uh, wanted to make a friend more than just a a sucker of a customer who. You know, it might have been impulse shopping. Um, but I love the idea of, you know, taking these pictures and, and I'm the one that sees th that picture. It will never be like that again. Although, you know, when you look at it, you're like, oh, OK, it looks like Saturn, but it's never the same picture, you know. Um, and so I thought it would be really neat. At any rate, the reason why I say all of this is because you're going to uh, get to see something possibly more than likely on the internet, not directly. Um, but you're going to get to see the rings of Saturn disappear in 2025. And it, when I thought about it, I was like, Oh, I know what's going to happen. Um, but it's a really neat effect. Uh, Z says we have someone in the community that streams their telescope views and pics and such. It's very cool. Oh, really? Hmm. Who is this? in the community. I'll have to look at the chat or at the discord. I assume that they're over at, um, uh, dunk stars channel. Yeah. Um, so here's, what's going to end up happening. Uh, the article by the way is over at newsweek.com black cats manor. Got it. Um, Saturn's spectacular rings are due to vanish from view for a breathtaking moment only two years from now. So stick this in your calendar to go and stare up into the sky for an extended period of time so you can see Saturn. Um, the gas giant's huge icy rings will disappear in March 2025, but they will reappear soon after. What's ending, what's going to happen is... Um, Based on the rotation of the planet and Earth, the ecliptic, we're going to end up on the same plane as Saturn's rings. So they'll virtually disappear. They'll still be there, but we will be parallel to them. So instead of seeing the wide angle of them, right? See how they're dipped down in the picture? Right. We'll just we'll, see like the edge or, or not really see it at all, I guess. Right. And if not enough, if it isn't backlit or hit right on the side with light, then we'll never, it'll just be black. We won't see it. Um, so I thought that it was really cool. And they actually talk about it, I think here. Yeah. So in 2023, you can see that they're starting to, we're starting to drop down in the plane and eventually in 2025 we'll just see maybe a slight sliver of it um, but only for moments if light is hitting it at the right angle so it happens something like every 13 to 17 years or something like that i'm not quite sure exactly it says the last time this was visible was in september 2009 and will occur again in october 2038 between then, in 2032, the ringed planet will be best angled away from Earth, allowing its rings to be seen in all their glory. So it'll be popped even further the other way so that you can see it more. Um, I, I think it's pretty amazing. And these are the moments, um, Z says, oh, that's neat. 
these are the moments why I wanted that, you know, telescope and camera and everything set up because you can just fire this thing up and point it out there and it will stay there with the equatorial mount. It'll stay programmed to point right at it because we actually turn um, and uh, it, without this special mount, it'll wobble away. Um, but you could be the one that takes this picture and you get to see, you could do it before, you know, during and, and, and after as we approach and you could have your own picture like this, but a, a real life picture, not a simulation. Okay. Now I want to go get all the, um, astrophotography equipment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do you think the same owners in the shop? <laughs> uh, probably to talk us out of it? actually, <laughs> I don't know. He was like uh, 20 years my senior, so he may not be. BCM will be like, uh, let's look at Saturn. And within like a minute, we're looking at it. It's nuts. That's what Z just said in chat. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. I'll have to pay more attention. Um, I haven't seen that discussion before. And streaming it is just amazing. So uh, I've... I've wanted to do that. Um, I've, I've actually set up in the past, a channel that did the inverse. <laughs> I didn't look out. I looked in, I had a microscope that was streaming in real time. Um, and I would control the, the uh, platen so that I could show where an amoeba was growing. Um, but, uh, that project was hampered by um, YouTube at the time. So anyway, um, it says we are lucky to be around to see Saturn's ring system, which appears to be in the middle of its lifetime. However, if rings are temporary, perhaps we just missed out on seeing giant ring systems of Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, which have only thin ringlets today. So, yep. You know, if somebody was around then and took a picture, Oh, look, another reason to have pictures of astronomical. Uh, I don't know what <laughs> events. Bodies. Yeah, uh, I was going to say bodies. Occurrences. But, yeah, this is an actual, it's a NASA image. What we're looking at now on the stream, you won't be able to see it in the podcast, obviously. But it's um, a picture of Saturn during its 2009 equinox taken by Cassini um, during the equinox, the rings appear to disappear from Earth's vantage point. So uh, obviously Cassini was at a different angle of attack, so they could see the actual rings. And what's really cool about these rings, you see little gaps and stuff. Um, there are actual bodies in there. Um, the whole idea of a thing called shepherd moons, that's what they're talking about. Um, there's a moon on either side of this. And the lot, the, the ring isn't perfectly straight. It actually has waves in it because the moons are shepherding the, the, uh, icy bodies in between them and making the rings happen broken. And then there's others that are different sizes, even inside here. It's not all smooth or contiguous. It's broken up quite a bit. Now that would be cool to get some photography of. Yep. I love this stuff. Um, yeah, Z, I'm going to have to uh, talk with Black Cat's Manor, I, or at least find their stream so that we can promote them um, here in Ohm Town. Um, okay, let's keep on going. Uh, this next article is over in Ohm Town Daily. Redwood Materials will recycle stationary storage batteries as it expands its scope. Um, I'm a big proponent of these, um, more ecologically sound solutions, recovering batteries. I'm a big proponent of fast swap battery technology, but we're seeing, or I should say, I am seeing and, and talking with the AI about this, that we've, we're seeing a decline in people buying EVs nowadays. And a lot of companies are seeing the writing on the wall. It's decelerating, so to speak, um, the adoption of EVs. And I think it's infrastructure based. I've heard 
countless people say that they don't want to get an EV because of the range anxiety um, and long charging times. And so maybe if they recycle all of these batteries, they recover all of these um, precious materials and it doesn't end up in landfills, maybe we can start leaning towards battery technology um, and fast swap battery technology as the foundation for vehicles instead of plugging in stuff all over the place. Um, you basically go into a gas station, you pay your 20 bucks, just like most people do for gas. And, and instead of um, only getting you know, 200 miles out of your battery and then having to sit for two hours while it charges, you just pull into another damn fast swap station. Um, but Redwood Materials is fundamentally one of these solutions that is going to make batteries cheaper in the future because you're not going to have to go and strip mine it out. Um, well, this particular solution is in Hawaii. So it's over at The Verge where the article is housed. But Andrew J. Hawkins is the author of this. And the deck statement says the company is recycling batteries from a four megawatt hour stationary storage substation attached to a solar farm in Hawaii. Um, so there you go. I mean, this um, is pretty um, industrial scale, right? Yes. Yeah. These aren't, you know, the batteries from an iPhone. Uh, by the way, Z said that I'd enjoy it. The, the, uh, the astrophotography stream from, I don't know if Black Cat wants me to announce that everywhere, but I've said it twice now. So, um, yeah, go for it, Z. Go ahead and send me the link. That would be awesome. Um, you know where it is. So me hunting for it would probably be needle in a haystack at this point. Um, but you're awesome. Thank you. Um, so it says here, it will be one of Redwood's first battery energy storage systems and an important step in the company's broader effort to prove that lithium ion batteries and storage energy storage products of all sizes can have a new life beyond their current ones. Um, it's um, the electric vehicle battery recycling and manufacturing venture founded by the former chief technologist of Tesla announced today that it will help decommission and recycle a four megawatt hour stationary storage substation in Kauai, Hawaii, um, as part of a massive solar array, the decommissioning recently wrapped and the batteries are now being transported to the company's facility in north nevada for recycling so that's going to be a boat out to i can imagine well, they don't want to recycle nevada, how are they going to get uh <laughs> there might be some trucks involved as well <laughs> nope they're just going to put it on like a, a native hawaiian raft and it will immediately sink to the bottom of the ocean <sighs> no it'll just get it's weird uh I understand why they wouldn't want to do it there in Hawaii. I mean, it's an ecosystem that you don't want to contaminate with a potential accident. Uh, but wow, that raises the cost quite a bit for recycling the materials. Um, but I'm sure that they don't even produce the batteries. I don't think that there's a battery producer in Hawaii at all. Um, they import everything, I think. So for uh, JB Straubel, former uh, Tesla CTO and founder of Redwood. It's a project that has come full circle. Straubel was involved in another installation project with the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative in 2015 while at Tesla. That project was a 52 megawatt hour battery installation plus a 13 megawatt uh, solar city solar farm. Um, oh, so this is very... Mm, what? I, I don't want to say... Uh, I know what you want to say, but I don't. Yeah. It's very close. Uh, that is exactly the word that I was held, use. I guess. But yes. Let's just say that it's a very circle the wagons, very insular. Um, the relationship is extremely close. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever the solution is. This is uh, whatever it is i think it's great because we're not just dumping this stuff somewhere it's going to be reutilized 
um, recovered and um, it doesn't just damage the ecosystem, particularly in Hawaii. Redwood Materials was founded in 2017. In addition to breaking down scrap from Tesla's battery making process with Panasonic, Redwood also recycles EV batteries from Ford, Toyota, Nissan, Specialized. Um, that's a new one to me. Maybe. Well, I don't know what that means. That can't be a company. Amazon, Lyft, Rad Power Bikes, and others. The company also produces anodes and cathodes, critical battery components, at a facility in South Carolina. Hey, it's almost like they are a hammer and everything battery is their nail. 95% of key battery metals on average, according to uh, Redwood. So they're going to be able to uh, reintegrate, recycle, recover. So by the way, Specialized is a company about that deals with like e-bike batteries. Deals with them. Oh, okay. But I yeah. think it's like a spin-off related to Redwood, et cetera. I'm not sure. Actually, I kind of, I think I know that name from somewhere, but hmm. anyway. Okay. Let's go on to the very last article for today. And um, this one is kind of interesting because I've been telling people that this is coming. <laughs> Um, and so I don't think anybody should be surprised. Uh, one of the, one of the bigger issues with fast food is because they're trying to, they being the executives of companies in fast food are trying to get, um, the most work done at the lowest price point. They don't necessarily care about the the people at the counters and so they just want them to do the job get it done blah 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 and it's slowly migrating away from human interaction at the counter why because artificial intel well it costs a lot to have a bunch of bodies just standing there mashing a button for somebody that could be walking up and mashing a button so you end up with this it's over in the hometown channel hometown daily channel over on hometown.com. There's going to be a lot more touchscreen kiosks at Burger King, and you'll probably end up ordering more too. So and didn't we have a, another article that talked about people actually preferring dealing with a, like a kiosk versus a person? Yes. Yep. Um, and it, and it's primarily because it lowers the error rate and you don't have to worry about somebody having a bad day. So uh, Burger King execs say the chain is planning to speed up the rollout of digital order kiosks. The U.S. is uh, is ready for kiosks now, RBI's CEO said. Following the tremendous results of trials, digital kiosks mean that restaurants save money on labor and customers typically order more. Um, the article's over at businessinsider.com. We've talked about this several times over the last two years. I can actually say two years. Man, that's such a long time. I wonder Christy. if these kiosks will be uh, in drive throughs or only in the restaurant because they could actually cut down on a lot of ordering problems if they were at the drive through because of audio problems. Yeah, um, I think what's going to end up is AI is going to be taking the order from the drive through because the kiosk is too clunky and people will jack it all up. You know, inside there's surveillance and personnel that be able to maintain it, babysit it. Um, but when it's outside, it's out in the elements. You have to do a whole lot more. Um, what do you call it? Like hardening. maintenance and yeah, uh, uh, hardening from the elements. It. Yep. So Grace Dean over at BusinessInsider.com put the article together, um, and that's really what the the nuts and bolts of this order, uh, uh, sorry, of this article is um, digital kiosks are large touch screens where diners can order and pay in restaurant instead of ordering from a staff member at a counter. Uh, Cobbs has said uh, Burger King had started piloting kiosks in more company owned restaurants with tremendous results. The vast majority of orders in these restaurants were placed using kiosks, he said. I actually don't go to the counter. I use a particular um, a gas station and I no longer even go to the counter. 
uh, because they put two kiosks uh, in the middle of the store. And now I just walk in, grab my stuff, ring it up, walk away, done and done. I don't have to worry about the line or, you know, somebody, uh, whatever. And I don't know if that says a lot about me um, or, you know, whoever's at the counter, but I don't have to worry about anything anymore. You know, I like, well, I, I, mean, if I always for efficiency that makes sense. And I, I feel compelled to have conversation. You know, I don't just want to sit there and plop my stuff on the counter and then just kind of robotically go through it. I, I don't know what it is about me, but I'm like, Hey, how you doing? You know, having a, having a good day, that kind of a thing. And, um, uh, now I, I just walk in and zip zap and I'm out. So the article here says, so I think this is a great thing for the business. He said, while RBI executive chairman, Patrick Doyle called him, them a win on every single front, except for the people who had this as an entry level job. Now, a lot of people use the, have a fast food job for well beyond entry level job. Um, it, for whatever reason that is their career and they're going to be doing this for 20 years. Um, arguably, uh, fast food jobs w were supposed to be entry level jobs. That's what they were, except for uh, executives, administrators within that particular franchise. Um, but it certainly seems like people are taking these jobs for longer periods of time. Um, but they're typically below poverty in terms of annual salary, which is obviously disconcerting if you're going to be doing this as your primary um, career. It says they can also promote items uh, likely to sell well based on the time of day, season, weather, such as showcasing ice drinks on hot days. Um, this, it's kind of like a, push the bacon where we have too much. And so it can lower the price and start pushing it automatically. That kind of thing. It has, it's such, uh, such a level of efficiency that you just can't yuck that yum as Z would say. Z says I'll pass on the niceties, but people still need jobs, man. Yep. I agree. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm stuck with the, I want to be fast and efficient, but I also am not a, an antisocial person who's just going to go in there, um, and get in and get out. Um, although well, I don't I, want people to lose jobs, but as a consumer, I think it is actually preferable to have a kiosk. Yeah. Uh, I, and I certainly do. Um, mainly because, uh, it's faster, it's more efficient. Um, in, in this kind of a situation where you can stack your decision-making, um, you just don't get that efficiency at the counter. Um, they may not hear you or they hit the wrong button or something like that. And I can't count how many times I've gotten the wrong order placed in my bag. So the author, uh, again, well, the article says, my point of view is we need to get this business to 100% digital, Cobza said. We should have all of the order taking done through digital ordering channels over time. That's sort of our North star of where we want to go with the business. What they're going to have eventually are vats in the back that are synthesizing this meat into a patty like substance and cooking it with robots and then putting it all together. And then it's just going to drop down a chute. <laughs> they're going to change their name to kiosk king and from burger king so they say it posted system-wide sales growth of 10.3 percent to 7.06 billion dollars in the quarter to september 30th compared with the same period in 2022 so global comparable sales were up 6.6 percent .6 in the u.s and 7.6 in the international markets by the way that's inflation that isn't profit um, the cost for fast food has gone up and a as I was told back in 2018, 20, I think it's 2019, mid 2019, I was told the era of cheap food is over. Um, and this was like done in a vacuum. Somebody just said it. I heard it. 
And sure enough, the very next year during the pandemic, the price starts shooting through the roof for food. Would have been a good time to stock up at uh, those warehouse clubs. <laughs> everything, everything that was food related, but I've missed that boat before, you know. Burger King is in the middle of a $400 million rebranding plan called Reclaim the Flame, which includes pumping money into advertising, digital investments, kitchen technology, and restaurant refits. Some of the refits that I've seen, though, are weird. The bigger sign has made way to a smaller sign. I don't understand why that would take place. Um, but refits are good. I think the reason why Toys R Us imploded is because it was stuck in 1972. If they would have evolved, I think that they would still be around. Um, so I'm, I think it's fine that they're reinvesting. I wish that they would pay people more, but that's okay. That too. I guess if wishes were cheeseburgers, we'd all have a whole bunch of cheeseburgers. Anyway. Let's get back into the party bus, drive back down Main Street, click that logo and get a whole bunch of new articles. Oh boy. What? The first one about the more uh, job cuts. Virgin Galactic to cut staff to focus on lower cost Delta spacecraft. I don't want budget cuts. <laughs> you should be spending more to make all of this cheaper. A $10 billion battle is brewing over ownership rights to a sunken warship believed to hold the biggest maritime treasure ever. Okay, we'll have to do that one tomorrow. Definitely. And we can look at this one too. Christie's sells a rare blue diamond for over $40 million. I got that in my uh, couch. Just shake it and $40 million fell out. And the Christie, Christie's uh, rare blue diamond fell out too amazing all right Ooh, star wars galaxy map and all regions explained hello well hello there let's see anything else kids versus aliens streaming Is that that's a, a little scary <laughs> yeah I don't know. it's probably animated or something um, that's it, folks. Yeah. That's it for today. Thank you all for coming and hanging out. I know that there are some in chat that are lurking and then uh, Z is having a, hopefully a nice time. But you're not passing on the niceties here, Z. So thanks for coming and hanging out. <laughs> There's no niceties here. Anyway, that's it for tonight. We'll see you tomorrow, 8 p.m. I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. Z says, uh, have a good day, both of you. Thanks for the stream. Thank you. Have a good night, and oh. we will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. Eastern. Oh, by the way, that was the sentient AI for those who are in the podcast. And uh, we're going to take it out of here. See you later. And uh, Z, it is always a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming and hanging out. Always good to see you. Okay, that's it. Bye bye. <laughs>